one. Okay, today I was going to talk to you about mycobacterium infections. Um, we're going to try to cover all the major mycobacteriums that you should be aware of. Uh, we'll park a little bit on tuberculosis and then hit the other ones. Um, I just wanted to show you why tuberculosis is frequently called the great imitator. So um, this was a case we had a 70 year old, short of breath, fevers, chills, sweats, weight loss. They thought he had a, a cancer with this right upper lobe mass cavitating, extending into the chest wall, acting like a cancer. So they stick a needle into it and of course all the fluid spills into the pleural space. He has a massive cytokine storm and has fevers, cough, worsens, and there was his mass and there's his empyema now caused by the uh, drainage of that mass and he wind up responding to ripe therapy and steroids and eventually the steroids were weaned off and he did quite well. So he didn't have to do a thoracentesis or anything? But he did have a thoracentesis mm -hmm. after that and um, it was full of the AFB, correct. Uh, here's um, an even um, interesting one about, again, the great imitator. 55-year-old gets right arm swelling. He was holding a board. He strained his muscle, and he had absolutely no systemic symptoms, no pulmonary symptoms. And so he gets referred to the orthopedic department because he has periosteal elevation and uh, ultimately an MRI shows a big mass, gadolinium positive, they think it's a sarcoma, they open it up, and of course it's KZ and pus and it's TB. And then retrospectively we go backwards and say, well let's see how contagious he was, and sure enough he does have an abnormal chest x-ray and was potentially contagious even though he was saying he had no cough. Uh, nobody converted their PPD when we did testing there, but again the great imitator strikes again. Uh, when I visited Tibet, um, this was on the wall of the hospital there. Their two big concerns are AIDS and tuberculosis. And uh, this was the uh, TB clinic where uh, as you go through those doors, there's their evidence of directly observed therapy with patients chart showing that every time they come up, there's a little mark there. So um, when we think of tuberculosis in the United States, we need to keep in mind that in the years 2001 is when for the first time the uh, people born outside the United States have exceeded those born in the United States and that uh, gap is continuing to rise. We all know the classic TB upper lobe x-ray, but when TB presents in other ways we don't always think about it. Again, another guy thought to have a lung cancer had this lesion, several lesions in his lungs, nondescript lesions, and ultimately the biopsy proved to be tuberculosis. But when we think of TB, we think of the upper lobe disease, the caseating necrosis, the cavity formation, and the granulomas. This is a non-caseating granuloma. These are the caseating cheese-like necrotizing granulomas with AFB positive. And remember, in a granuloma, you have all of these uh, walled off bugs inside multinucleated giant cells, epithelioid cells, and that wall is going to potentially stay there for decades. The problem is as they take some of these newer anti-TNF drugs, the wall of that granuloma may break down, and that big concern with using these drugs are mycobacterium tuberculosis with a whole list of other organisms. And if you like other mycobacterium other than tuberculosis, you can see that associated with the anti-TNFs, we have mycobacterium avium complex, M. chelonii, abscessus, marinum, and other mycobacterium have all been reported. Of course, we have the miliary TB pattern and those that are very immune suppressed, named after the millet seeds. We have tuberculous pleural effusions, which um, are very hard to diagnose, require pleural biopsy. And uh, you can do some special studies on the fluid. PCR is frequently negative. And uh, eventually, if it does reach a head and reach a point, it would be a cold abscess, as you can see here in the back. And when it ultimately drains, you'll see this caseating necrosis. 
We have ter tuberculous pericarditis, and that can lead to constrictive pericarditis. Uh, and the TB at different ages, remember the young tends to have more dissemination. The 5 to 13 has more lower lung hyler, and the older than 13 has the classic upper lobe presentations. And when we think of HIV, we think of late HIV with low immune system presents with the lower middle lobe more so than the upper lobe, and extra pulmonary is much more likely with late tuberculosis. Now, the PPD test has always been the mainstay of uh, following healthcare workers after exposures and looking for that in duration of 10 millimeters or higher. And now we have the uh, quantiferon gold and other tests like that where we can actually measure it without worrying about reader variability with the size of these PPDs, no BCG drug interactions, and uh, so no cross reactions with that. And if the patient's allergic, you can still use the test. Now, um, a lot of times we always wonder how long after an exposure should someone have a PPD test? And the answer is if you go eight weeks after the exposure, you're pretty much by a PPD uh, likely to get a conversion. If you do it sooner than two weeks, then it's obviously too late and everything in between. So eight weeks is the magic number. Now, an old study in 1969 was interesting because they used this Beatty antigen PPDB, which had a cross-reaction with Mycobacterium avium complex, and they found that uh, Mycobacterium avium complex seems to be more <coughs> found in the southeast United States and the southern states than in the northern states. So that was how they came up with uh, finding it more in that area. Now, when you're exposed to someone with tuberculosis, Remember, it's how close you are, how infectious is the patient, cavities more so than a granuloma or a nodule, <clears throat> excuse me, and then being in a room for more than 10 minutes with close contact is considered a very close, a close con contagion. Remember, a sneeze is very contagious, followed by a cough, which is equivalent to talking for five minutes. And the reason why AFB smears are frequently negative with a positive culture is because the AFB smear requires up to 10,000 organisms per ml of sputum to detect it. So when you think of TB therapy, it started out with the sanatoriums, then they came up with cavity closure, collapse therapy. 46 saw streptomycin, but resistance developed quickly within a couple months. 52 was isoniazid. Rifampin, 1970, and then pyrazine amide of then the other quinolones, macrolides, came out, directly observed therapy. So we all know the right therapy, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, thambitol with the aminoglycoside streptomycin as our first-line drugs. And then we started worrying about resistance with INH rifampin being multi-drug resistance, homelessness, HIV, foreign acquisition, etc. Now, when we get into resistant MTB, which I'm not going to touch on, but you may wind up on therapy for 24 months, and then you want to use a drug other than inatrofampin if it's resistant, such as a quinolone or an aminoglycoside that you can see there in addition to the other two. And now we're not only into directly observed therapy, we're into directly observed therapy short course where if we can get people in third world countries on these regimens, we have a two to three times higher cure rates and less, three times less resistance. Now, to focus in on extra pulmonary TB, this is why it's the great imitator. We don't think of it outside the lungs. So for meningitis, you want to think of base of the brain, cranial nerve palsy, chronic, pleural effusions, pericarditis. We talked about osteomyelitis. It likes the spine, then the long bones, then the large joints. Then GU, we think of sterile pyuria, and then it could be in the male GU organs, the female GU organs in that order. GI is very tricky, whether it's enteritis, mesenteric lymphadenitis, or peritonitis. And then um, if you think of someone with a mesenteric lymphadenitis, your classic three infectious diagnosis have always been um, tuberculosis, Yersinia pestis, Crohn's disease, which may or may not be an infectious disease, and of course lymphoma, and then there's a host of other things. So those are always in your differential of mesenteric lymphadenopathy. Now lymphadenitis is called scrofula, mostly cervical, supraclavicular axillary. 
This, though, is the classic association with fibrosis medius tinnitus, which is superior vena cava syndrome, but TB can do it. If you have a skin manifestation with TB, we call those tuberculids. And then you got the rare locations of your body, like laryngeal TB, very contagious, painless drainage from your ears, otitis media, and even uveitis, just like we see with sarcoidosis. Now, for scrofula, <clears throat> most of your scrofula is MTB, but M. bovis can do it, M. canzaceae, M. AI <clears throat> are the others, and M. scrofulaceum. Uh, scrofula likes the uh, cervical area primary. Here's the supraclavicular. Here's the axillary and the neck area. This would be called Pott's disease with the spine involvement. And then if this were an x-ray, you would be looking for that triangle there called the gibbous, G-I-B-B-U-S, which is pathognomonic for tuberculosis. Now, Sir Percifer Pott named Pott's disease TB of the spine, but he also named a staph aureus or strep infection of the frontal sinus with a periosteo elevation, and who knows the name of this? Pott's puffy tumor. So Pott's named two diseases, the Pott's disease, TB of the spine, and then an unrelated thing called Pott's puffy tumor. Now, TB of the spine loves to eventually make it into your psoas muscle and may ultimately drain into your thigh, as we had a case of that. So TB of uh, the spine spreading to the psoas muscle, forming the psoas abscess. And remember, when it does form an abscess, it's a cold abscess full of lymphocytes, macrophage, and less neutrophils. And that would be the caseating pus that would drain out. TB of the kidneys, sterile pyuria, renal insufficiency, and then ultimately you get hydronephrosis, you get blockage of the ureters, and the kidney starts to form cavities just like the lung does. It can all the way go down to the testes and the whole GU organs. TB meningitis, cranial nerve palsies, base of the brain, basilar meningitis. And you can see the openings where CSF should flow may clog up and you get hydrocephalus. So there's your classic TB meningitis, base of the brain, and the hydrocephalus that can result. Notice those granulomas all at the base of the brain and those caseating necrosis AFB positive. Now, what are the tuberculids? Can you name the most common tuberculid is called what? Bazin's disease, also known as erythema indoratum, occurs as 86% of all the tuberculids, and it looks sort of like an enodosum kind of picture. Erythema indoratum, okay? This guy was doing an autopsy and so with TB, so what would you call this one? TB of the skin from a trauma, from a scalpel or something. And that would be uh, prosectors, warts, or tuberculosis varicosa cutis. And then this guy, um, we would like to uh, write up, had these ulcers developing on his legs, and then within a month he has TB. We treat his TB as ulcers go away. So this was a bizarre uh, manifestation of TB in his legs, and he was on chronic decadron for a brain tumor. So we've just covered MTB, but I want you to be aware there's M. bovis, M. africanum in the MTB complex. Then you got the slow-growing mycobacterium, Runyon classified them how they grew in the light or dark or made pigment. Photochromogens like Kansasii marinum grow in the light, photochrome pigment. They make pigment in the light. Gordonii scrofulaceum was growing in the dark. So scoto, dark, chrome, pigment, dark. Scrofulaceum, by the way, actually grows very rapidly. So it may be under the rapid growers uh, currently. And then the non-chromogens don't make pigment, such as Mycobacterium avium, Terrier, ulcerans, Zenopi. So, here's a guy, bladder cancer, getting BCG installation into his bladder, a common theme at our hospital, which is a cancer <coughs> hospital, and what is the organism in BCG? Attenuated Mycobacterium bovis, right? So, he develops fevers, he's got... This infiltrate, which looks like ground glass, but on closer inspection, you can see little dots consistent with miliary TB patterns. So he has disseminated mycobacterium bovis. Now, when you think of BCG infectious complications, 
Uh, what are they? And you're going to get these phone calls and requests. So hematuria, obviously, granulomas in your prostate. You can get a pneumonitis, hepatitis. Arthralgias are big deals. Epididymitis, sepsis, rash, ureter obstruction, contracted bladder, renal abscess, cytopenia. And then your take-home message is, what am I going to treat BCG and bovis with? The answer is ripe therapy, rifampin, INH, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, but which one doesn't work of ripe? So without the PZA, pyrazinamide, and don't forget, the patient may actually need steroids like our case uh, required in addition to the TB treatment. Now, when we think of M. bovis, what do you think of? 1 to 2 percent of TB in developed countries is M. bovis. The majority of TB cases in Los Angeles at 54 percent, San Diego, that whole area, all their TB, 56, 54 percent, was M. bovis. Why is that? Well, they have a heavy immigrant population from Mexico, and so um, they may have had a lot of TB from that population. And um, where do you see our, excuse me, M. bovis, which is in the MTB complex, cattle, elk, deer, seal, uh, zookeepers taking care of elephants, rhinos, and then not to be outdone, the zookeeper with the TB or other people caring for have now given MTB to the elephants. So um, we can get M. bovis from them, they can get MTB from us. And then um, drinking or handling contaminated milk is a big one. So that's why developed countries don't have as much because their milks typically are handled and pasteurized. So handling, drinking, contaminated milk. The good news is human-to-human -human transmission is very rare, unlike MTB where that's fairly common. And then just like we talked about with BCG, it's inherently resistant to uh, which TB drug of right? Answer is pyrazinamide, okay? Now, what bug do you get with pedicures? Which comes to mind, and it can give you outcomes like this? Well, that's the rapidly growing mycobacterium, right? And so what are those? That's M. fortuitum chelonia abscessus, grows within one week or less. It's worldwide found in surface oils, water, soil, tap water, known to cause nosocomial and iatrogenic infections. They develop following inhalation or direct inoculation from trauma or surgery, chronic localized infection in the immunocompetent, disseminated in the immunosuppressed. Of this series, five of 123 rapid growers, surgical site infections and breast surgery from 2006 to present, out of 6,369 procedures, 2% were infected with a rapidly growing mycobacterium in one series. So you will see them. They're not the most common, but they're very hard to treat. So when you think of outbreaks, what do you think of with rapidly growing mycobacterium? Well, the nail salon, Whirlpool foot bath in California, it was M. fortuitum causing fur uncles. There were 61 patients. The mean disease duration was 170 days. There was 48 uh, treatment antibiotic regimens over four months given to these patients. The sensitivity for this M. fortuitum was mostly with Cipro and minocycline. And earlier treatment obviously had a shorter duration of disease, so you have to pick these things up early. One patient did have lymphatic dissemination, and that was published in Clinical Infectious Disease in 2004. What about another outbreak? Nail Salon, Whirlpool, Foot Bath, California, M. fortuitum, 110 patients, number of boils, two, with as many as 37, that's a lot. Uh, shaving legs with a razor before pedicure was a risk factor for infection, traumatizing the area. New England Journal of Medicine, 2002. What about liposuction? Liposuction has been a problem. As you can see here, it requires pulsating water and suctioning that area out. What about outbreaks with that? Well, lipotourism from the US to Dominican Republic in 2003-2004, eight healthy Hispanic females underwent abdominoplasty. Symptoms develop about seven weeks later. They presented with painful red draining sub -Q abdominal nodules, two of the eight correctly diagnosed at presentation. That means six of them were not. 
Seven required INDs, six combo antibiotics including macrolides, IV antibiotics such as cefoxidin, imipenem, amikacin, and or Zyvox. All but one cured after a meeting of nine months. And uh, that was ultimately published in Clinical Effects 2008. What about some more outbreaks? Uh, illicit soft tissue augmentation in New York City. Injected hyaluronic acid derivative, two tender red sub-Q nodules of the face and buttocks at the injection site, M. abscessus was the culprit, cured with biaxin and prednisone, published in a dermatology journal of 2003. What about breast implants? Well, 14 confirmed non-tuberculous mycobacterium infections, 14 possible, one probable, 492 breast stamp procedures in Brazil at 12 hospitals, all different genotype except hospital C. There was no risk factors identified, and that was published in Journal of Hospital Infection in 07. Here is another one that was published. A patient with a rapidly growing mycobacterium infection of the breast reconstruction flap, reconst recurrent abscesses around the flap, Further debridement, second reconstruction that was published in a British Journal of Plastic Surgery. Another one, 32-year-old female, breast augmentation, 48 days later has pain, swelling of the breast, M. chelonii grew from the aspirin of the fluid, and that was published in a plastic surgery journal. What about at Moffitt? What have we been seeing over there? Uh, the predominant of our organisms are infortuitum abscessus chelonii, the bottom is supposed to depict the years, and uh, you can see we get them mostly from bronchoscopy, sputum, skin tissue, breast, breast, sputum, tissue. So uh, central lines, occasionally bacteremias also show up. Um, now, what about facelifts and other forms of plastic surgery? Well, uh, an outbreak with facelifts in New Jersey, outpatient surgical center, four patients at M. chelonii, Contaminated methylene blue used as a tissue marking agent. So the tissue marking agent could be contaminated, and that was published in MMWR in 2004. And you get these painful nodules that are unsightly and may leave constant hyperpigmentation. What do you get from cleaning your fish tank? Mycobacterium marinum, which can give you a sporotrichoid pattern, as you can see here. Treat it with macrolides, uh, tetradoxy, minocycline, uh, sometimes Bactrim, or Fampanathamitol. Okay, a kid in Africa with this, what's it called? World Health Organization trying to eradicate it. Beruli's ulcer, named after the Beruli district in Uganda, right? So this is called M. ulcerans. Beruli ulcer, named after the Beruli district of Uganda. If you get it in Australia, they call it Barnsdale ulcer. It's the third most common mycobacterium worldwide with TB leprosy dominating, so that's pretty amazing. We didn't really realize it, but it's the third most common mycobacterium. Uh, 30 tropical countries, the greatest frequency in Africa is in the Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Benin. In Africa, it's mostly the 5 to 15 year olds, so kids. In Australia, it's the older person. They believe there's a contaminated water exposure working in a farm area where there's mud and getting into that muddy environment. The treatment uh, that has been quite successful because these are third world countries, they don't have a lot of money, right? So they use rifampin and streptomycin, but in places where you can get them, biaxin, other macrolides, uh, uh, quinolones, moxiflox, and even Bactrim has been successful. Just to mention, I heard they also do heat therapy with this. Yeah. So sometimes yes. yeah. impoverished countries are actually applying some very hot material onto the ulcer. The idea that, that the uh, temperature is still the mycobacteria because it's a toxic Yes, yeah, so heat therapy has also been known to be successful with mycobacterium ulcerans. Okay, the hot tub and the water heater can spread which bug? Well, women between 50 to 70 getting this cough, occasional hemoptysis. And it likes the lingula and the right middle lobe, forming these bronchiectasis, distal nodules, tree and bud. And we know that is Lady Windermere syndrome, a, named after the Oscar Wilde play Lady Windermere's fan. So that's MAI treatment, combining it with a macrolide, a quinolone, a thambutol, or rifampin, 
and then the IV drugs, amicacin, carbapenem, sufoxidin, and even finally gamma interferon. Now, what's the bug if you have MAI in the past, and now you have a recurrent cough, achalasia, acid reflux, and it's growing within five days? That's a rapidly growing mycobacterium, as this lady had with her bronchiectasis, distal nodules, and the train tracts of bronchiectasis. So this is a rapidly growing mycobacterium, mostly abscesses, occasionally chelonia fortuitum, loves to follow structural lung damage, achalasia, acid reflux. Similar drugs also are used uh, for that. And then in the elderly male, we see MAI, mycobacterium avium intracellular, looking almost like tuberculosis or chronic scarred fibrosis. And then, of course, in our HIV low immune system patient, this guy had um, a biopsy proven mycobacterium, abs, uh, excuse me, Kansasii abscess. So, mycobacterium Kansasii is another one of those mycobacterium that can occur in healthy people or in immune suppressed. So this was a case of an, a brain abscess. And then finally, what other mycobacterium have I not talked about yet? Yep. Leprosy. So this guy was on leprosy treatment in South America. And if you use your idea, maybe he has some facial features, maybe not, but uh, wasn't very impressive, whereas this is a classic uh, leonine facies of lepromatous leprosy with the thickening of the ears, the forehead, the nose sort of caving in as the cartilage destroyed, the loss of the eyebrows, the mustache, and the AFB positives, as you can see here, with the spectrum going from tuberculoid leprosy with no AFB, lots of granulomas, to lepromatous leprosy with lots of AFB to borderline in the middle, and then borderline lepromatous and tuberculoid. Remember these hypopigmented uh, anesthetic patches, the little nodules, and then eventually the loss of limbs that can occur. And then the nerves that are more superficial where it's colder than the internal tend to be enlarged, bony destruction can develop the claw deformity. And then the nerve there thickening uh, on the foot where it goes superficial. And then those hypopigmented patches that are anesthetic, you want to think of those. And then a fellow on the east coast of Florida sent me this picture where it was a 13-year-old Haitian girl, never left the U.S., who was diagnosed with leprosy and theoretically got it from maybe uh, people that were in her family coming back from Haiti.